When you think back, what were your chances for success in this world? For success, there was none. Absolutely none. Um, the only way I could survive was to prove everybody wrong. Over and over, over and over. And, over and that's just, it, it, helps, it helps me to continue to fight. To be honest, it's unbelievable that she's even alive today, let alone plastered on posters, collaborating with Beyonce, and performing on the world stage. We traveled to Amsterdam, where Michaela de Prince is a star ballerina with the Dutch National Ballet. But the stories that play out up on stage, as melodramatic as they might be, can't even come close to Michaela's own miraculous journey of perseverance, dedication, and survival. Michaela's story starts here, in the impoverished African country of Sierra Leone. She was born in 1995, named Mabinti Bangura, in the midst of a civil war that killed thousands. Her father was killed by rebels, and her mother died soon after from disease and starvation. Uh, I can't remember what my biological parents looked like. I can't really remember any happy moments. Three-year-old Mabinti was abandoned at an orphanage where she was treated like a pariah. The women at the orphanage, they called you? The devil's child. They kept saying, why would somebody want to adopt the devil's child? So they saw the pigmentation and they thought that it was evil? Yeah, definitely. Mabinti was born with the skin condition vitiligo. What she called her spots were the reason the adults in the orphanage thought she was cursed. So they ranked us like number one was the favorite child and number 27 was the least favorite. I was number 27. So number one gets the first dibs at food? Yeah, first dibs at food, first choice of clothes. So what did number 27 end up with? Pretty much rags. She had only one friend at the orphanage, number 26, also named Mabinti. She was way down in the pecking order simply because she was left-handed and wet the bed. So you were tight? Yeah. We were like tighter like than sisters. peanut butter and like jelly. It was like, yeah. Then one fateful day, number 27 made a random discovery that would change her life. A gust of wind blew a magazine up against the gate outside the orphanage, and she found it. This is a copy of that magazine, and this image of a ballerina on the cover gave a desperately sad orphan something she'd never had before. I needed this to come into my life at the time that it did come, and I needed to find something to, to give me hope. She had never seen anything like it. A white woman in strange clothes standing on her toes. Number 27 showed it to a beloved teacher. And she explained to me she was a ballerina dancing ballet. And that's what I wanted to be, ballerina. And it was not ju just the fact that she's a ballerina, it's that she looks happy. And I wanted to be happy. But that hope was smashed by unimaginable horror. She was about to endure something so tragic that the memory is still scalding. Outside the orphanage, rebels attacked that favorite teacher of hers. She was pregnant and they cut her stomach open because they had a bet. They wanted to know if it was a girl or a boy. And so they decided to find out. When Mabinti tried to help her teacher, a rebel boy turned on her, slicing her stomach with a machete. She was spared only because a night watchman at the orphanage begged for her life. When I got stabbed, I was really hoping. I felt very much alone. I really wanted to die. I didn't see the point. I didn't think I would have anything good my life at all. Her tears, her pain would only deepen. Even as Americans were coming to adopt the orphans, her best friend, number 26, was one of the lucky ones, chosen by a family who sent a book of photos. But no one was coming for number 27. Everybody else, you know, they all had family books and... Sorry. And there was no book for you. Nope. Number 26 got a book. And from what I understand, you would look at her book. You knew you wanted to adopt. This yeah, is the woman who sent me. that book of photos. Oh, Elaine de Prince was looking to fill her own void, an equally unimaginable one. 
Elaine and her husband Charles had adopted before three American boys. Tragically, they all would die of AIDS from contaminated blood. After the first two deaths, Elaine was heartbroken, but she wasn't going to let that stop her from living and loving. I decided to adopt one child from a war-torn country in Africa because my son Michael loved Africa. That orphan was number 26. And then I got a call from the adoption agency and they asked, which Mbindi are you adopting? They said, we have two of them. The orphanage told Elaine that 12 families had refused to take the other Mabinti, number 27, because of her vitiligo. I said, well, we'll take her. Just so, like that? Just like that. I said, we'll take her. I said, I really don't have a problem with spots after dealing with AIDS. When Elaine arrived in Africa to adopt both four-year-olds, she was the one who broke the unexpectedly good news to number 27. She was standing there with her arms folded, really angry. I think she just thought there was going to be more rejection ahead of her. Then she takes our hands and she says, I'm your new mama. Because it would be hard to have two Mabintis, Elaine renamed both girls after her son Michael, the one who loved Africa. Number 26 became Mia Mabinti de Prince and number 27, Michaela Mabinti de Prince. One of the first things Michaela did was show her new mom that treasured magazine cover. I couldn't believe that I had adopted an orphan from Africa who wanted point shoes. <laughs> she wanted to be a ballerina. I had to promise her she would dance. But first, the sisters started their new adventure in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, where everything was a wide-eyed revelation. I mean, I had never seen so much food before, and I didn't understand that you had to really pay for it. I was just picking things and eating them. As if it's free. <laughs> as, yeah, as if it was free. Before long, Michaela's mom made good on her promise, and Michaela started ballet. Mia, too. Well, sort of. There were a few times where we were in I class was, together, yeah, and we I, I'm very <laughs> serious. And I'm like, yeah. why are you talking? Yeah. It's not time to laugh. No, she would, give me, she would give me like these death. looks. Stop talking. I don't know. It was like we were in a professional company or something. <laughs> the looks that she was giving me, like she was a director or something. Even at that young age, Michaela was laser focused on becoming a professional ballerina. But first, she had to get over her insecurities about the way she looked. I remember my first show, I was terrified because I thought, okay, well, if people can see my spots, that meant I could not become the ballerina I wanted to be. So I asked my mom, like, can you like, make sure, like, if you see it, let me know. And I said, no, not really. They look like pixie dust. And she says, oh, good. Now I can be a professional ballerina. But while Michaela got more comfortable with her skin condition, she faced other obstacles because of the color of her skin. When I was eight years old, this teacher said, you know, we don't put a lot of effort into the black ballerinas because they all end up getting fat and having big boobs. Did you ever think that she wouldn't be able to make it as a professional ballerina because of her skin color? I knew that it would be difficult but she was just a very determined child. <laughs> when she got something in her head, she went for it. Michaela had defied long odds before, of course, and soon enough, she was doing it again, breaking through and soaring up the dance ranks. By 17, she was performing with the Dance Theater of Harlem in New York City, the youngest in the company. The following year, she was hired by the prestigious Dutch National Ballet in Amsterdam. At 18, she was supporting herself and living out her unlikely dream. So what does it take to become a world-class ballerina? Practice, practice, practice. So we're going to watch one. I'm known for being one of the highest jumpers. I'm literally flying in the air. And that feeling, it's incredible. Get there quicker. Ballet director Ted Branson not only hired Michaela, but recently promoted her to soloist. The... Ah, yes. What are her strengths? Apart from her really strong physical presence and her strong technique, it's a really good mind and a will to succeed. An inner strength? Yeah. At age 22, she's only one level below the top ranked ballerinas in the company. Cause a winner don't quit on themselves. 
And last year, she had her brush with superstardom. Beyonce handpicked Michaela to choreograph her own dance solo in the Freedom music video from Lemonade. I was like, that's Michaela, that's Michaela. And I started going like this. And she's sitting kind of close to Beyonce, but you know, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal, right? No, it was not at all. No. <laughs> Michaela is also the new face of Jockey's Show Em What's Underneath campaign. There was a time when you asked your mom to look from the audience and let you know if she could see what you called your spots. Yeah. And now here you are, yeah. proudly showing it all off. Yeah. It's real, it's raw, it's showing them who you really are. From an orphan with nothing to live for to a young girl with big dreams, and now a dazzling ballerina. Pretty girl. <laughs> Is there anything that you would want to say to Michaela's birth parents, if you could? I think I would like her mother to know that she has made something of herself. She saw her child as looked down upon. This child has risen from that. It's not a fairy tale, you know. You have to work hard. There is a, a lot of loss and a lot of pain, but. You know, performing, I love it. You seem kind of persistent. Yeah, it's a little bit. <laughs> hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.